so variational learning of many body quantum systems. So we're going to discuss complex, complex quantum many body interactions. So thank you. you can... Okay, Th thank you, uh, Ricardo, for the introduction and uh, uh, also for uh, uh, inviting me to, to this conference. It's great to be here, even though only remotely, but uh, I guess it's still a good opportunity to discuss about these topics. Um, so today I'm going to um, somehow uh, discuss about the recent uh, developments that we've been doing in uh, when studying uh, 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 with variational techniques uh, and uh, machine learning approaches, uh, many body quantum systems. So in a sense, I will really uh, try to, um, to answer the la last question that uh, Gabor was, uh, was uh, asking in his talk. So basically, how do we study, um, uh, let's say, ab initio, many body quantum systems solving the Schrodinger equation? So the, the problem indeed here is that uh, if you are dealing with uh, a many body uh, quantum system, uh, the, the, the main issue is that uh, if you want to describe its physical properties, uh, again, in principle, without doing any uh, approximation, uh, you know that uh, in general, this object is, uh, is exponentially complex. So let's focus, for example, to the simple case of uh, discrete degrees of freedom, for example, quantum spins that can be either up or down, and I have n of these. So you know that in this case, essentially, uh, you have your wave function is a, is a complex vector uh, in, in a complex vector space. And the size of this vector space is two to the n, right? So it's exponential in the number of spins. And because of this complexity, and because in principle, you need to specify all of these coefficients if you want to compute all physical properties, solving the Schrodinger's equation, as Gabor was alluding to, is a, is a, is a very hard problem uh, and can be uh, typically solved for large systems only in an approximate way. Uh, even though, you know, essentially what we are really after are typically, not always, but typically only the lowest eigenvalue of this, uh, uh, of the Hamiltonian operator, which to all purposes, uh, I mean, and for the remainder of my talk, will be again uh, a sparse uh, local uh, um, uh, operator uh, that is uh, defined on these 2 to the n times 2 to the n uh, vectors. Now, um, so what is our best hope, uh, I would say, I would argue to, to solve this problem? Well, in principle, uh, I think that uh, modern techniques that uh, deal with uh, the solution of Schrodinger equation, uh, accurate solution of, the, of this problem, um, uh, really deal with uh, the variational formulation of the problem. So what we do is that instead of uh, taking the full uh, Psi as before here, what we do is that we, we consider parameterization of Psi that I call Psi of W, where W is a possibly very large set of parameters. And what we do is that we form the expectation value of the Hamiltonian over this, uh, this Psi. So here I'm using uh, quantum physics notation, Brian Katz, but this is essentially an integral over um, of this, uh, or if you want a, a matrix vector product uh, of, over this trial state. And we know from the variational uh, theorem that this object is larger or equal than the exact ground state energy. So what we can do is that we can try to minimize this quantity as a function of W. And this will give us really the best approximation we can do for the ground state within this family of variational states. So in this talk, I will essentially treat two different uh, approaches to solve this variational problem. So the first one is based on using uh, uh, classical variational states. So by classical, I mean that uh, I can use a, a CPU if you want, or a GPU um, to um, uh, basically uh, represent uh, my, 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 my variational state. Uh, specifically, I will use neural networks to represent it. Uh, and then I will show you how we can uh, minimize this energy function using uh, machine learning uh, inspired techniques. And in the second half of my talk, towards the end, I will show instead how we can parameterize this, uh, this function uh, using uh, a quantum computer, essentially. Uh, and uh, I will also uh, tell more about some uh, machine learning inspired approaches that one can use to, uh, to minimize this energy that are somehow also very connected to what happens in the classical world. So what, what about classical variational state? So the main issue here that we would like to, to address, which I, I think it's a really fundamental issue in the field, is really to have uh, a sufficiently flexible, so flexible, flexible means that uh, in principle we can achieve uh, all the accuracy we want uh, for this uh, Schrodinger's equation, um, but also computational efficiency. So there's a tension, of course, as also Gabor was showing, between the computational efficiency, so how much expensive these techniques are, and also how flexible they are, so how accurate they are. Um, and indeed, we know a lot of very accurate uh, and uh, potentially exact uh, wave functions that, uh, however, have uh, a relatively uh, high cost, too high cost, which is uh, 
typical exponential in the number of spins, in the number of, uh, of constituents, electrons, if you want. And those are not an option if you want to, to scale on large systems. So we are really after something that is a good compromise between these two uh, requirements. So our proposal for this uh, was introduced uh, already three years ago or more uh, in this paper with Matthias Stroyer. And the idea is that uh, we parameterize the, the wave function. So really this amplitudes, uh, psi up, up, down, and down, up that, uh, that I introduced here. So basically all these coefficients uh, are nothing but what I, what I write here, so psi of S1 and the sensor, these are the classical projections of the, of the spin, up, down, uh, or down, up, etc. And I have two to the end of those. And the, the, basically what we do is that we parameterize these amplitudes with a neural network that takes an arbitrary string of, uh, of these uh, spins and outputs a scalar. So the only uh, difference, if you want, uh, with respect to standard neural networks is that this scalar is typically a complex value. So because, again, the wave function is, uh, in general, a complex valued object. Um, and uh, in, uh, in, in the past years, we've been uh, going from uh, very shallow networks that were those uh, introduced in this paper, like uh, restricted Boltzmann machines, to uh, much deeper. And uh, I will show some results uh, also with much deeper networks in this talk. Um, but again, the, the, one of the, uh, the main consequences of using a neural network to represent wave functions is that we are after complex valued objects. And this can be achieved in mainly in two ways. So one possibility is to have complex weights, and this is what we did in this paper. But uh, another possibility, and having uh, activation functions that are somehow holomorphic in the complex domain, um, or the other possibility is having instead uh, wave functions, so neural networks, deep networks that are linear, that are, sorry, uh, real valued, uh, but with two outputs. So one representing the amplitude and the other one representing the phase. So these are two equally, uh, I would say, uh, suitable uh, ways of, uh, of uh, parameterizing the wave functions, and those have been used and are being used extensively in the literature. So um, I won't have time too much to, to discuss the general uh, properties of these states, uh, but uh, um, you, you can have a look at some of the recent results in this review that, uh, that we wrote last year. But uh, uh, essentially, the, the main uh, message is that uh, if you have uh, some known, uh, historically known, if you want, variational state, uh, for example, variational states like uh, the Laughlin wave function used to describe uh, topological properties of matter or even matrix quantum states, just for wave functions, uh, those are, uh, are known to, to support uh, uh, compact representations in terms of these neural networks. Um, so these are somehow also a way to, uh, to, to connect to, to Previously, physics-inspired wave functions that have been introduced to describe some specific um, uh, phenomena. Uh, but there is also some interesting property that has been proven uh, uh, last year in the context of deep networks that uh, deep networks uh, with short-range filters, so for example, a, a deep neural network based on, on component, uh, also a component, can represent efficiently uh, volume law states. So volume law is a, is a property of the entanglement entropy of these quantum wave functions. Um, that is typically hard to represent, for example, if you have uh, short-range uh, uh, wave functions like mean field wave functions or uh, uh, even uh, tensor network wave functions that are intrinsically uh, uh, focusing on the physics of local uh, uh, interactions. Instead, with this kind of, of properties or so using components, you can uh, efficiently encode volume law uh, scaling of, of the entanglement. Now, let's go to the... To the sorry, oops. To, to the problem of, uh, of uh, uh, minimizing the energy with this, uh, with this approach. So what we do is that we follow uh, the somehow prescription that was already known from the 60s, from uh, the work of Macmillan. And the idea is that we can rephrase uh, the, the expectation value of the Hamiltonian uh, um, as uh, a, a statistical expectation value over the square uh, models of the probability distribution. So this is, if you want, a, a, now an equivalent classical probability distribution parameterized by our neural network. And uh, you can show that the expectation value of the Hamiltonian, so the energy that I wrote before, is nothing but the loss function, which is the expectation value of some suitable estimator that is called local energy over this uh, probability distribution parameterized by my parameters. So there is an important difference, uh, for example, with respect to what you've seen before, in the sense that here we are not using any data set. So we are really after finding self-consistently, if you want, a solution to this problem that minimizes this loss function. Um, and we do that really by, by fixing W, sampling from size W, 
computing the gradient of this object and then updating the Ws and resampling again from this probability distribution. So this is uh, shown uh, a little bit more in detail uh, in this slide, where essentially you see that, uh, um, um, so the, where I give a, a, an expression for the local energy, which is uh, basically only um, expressed in terms of the Hamiltonian matrix elements, which are just given by the physics of the problem, if you want, uh, and by your answers, which is fixed at that point with uh, your variation weights. Uh, and then once you know the local energy and you know these operators, which are nothing but the derivative, the gradient of the local, of this, um, of the logarithm of the wave function uh, with respect to some parameter k, then you can compute, for example, the, the gradient of the, of the local energy, of the total energy, just as a statistical expectation value again over this probability distribution. So just by sampling from this psi square, from this probability, you can ever uh, uh, compute both as, as stochastic estimates of the gradient uh, of the energy and the energy uh, itself. Uh, and what one typically does is that one uses uh, automatic differentiation to compute these, uh, these, uh, these OKs, uh, or in some cases, even the, the full uh, uh, expectation value of the, of the Hamiltonian using some uh, specific tricks. Now, uh, the other point, of course, is how do we optimize these, uh, these, uh, these, uh, these, the, the parameters once we know the gradients. Uh, of course, we can use any uh, stochastic approach used in machine learning, like Adam or any other sort of first order approximations. But it turns out that for uh, the purposes of, uh, of these uh, simulations, it is often uh, much more efficient in terms of uh, iterations and accuracy to use a second order or, I mean, uh, in, uh, let's say roughly second order, because not strictly speaking second order, but let's say a curvature based method, um, which uh, uh, is known in, in, in the literature of Parisian Monte Carlo as a stochastic reconfiguration but that uh, it's strongly connected to uh, the natural gradient method uh, in the machine learning uh, community. So essentially what we do is that we, uh, we, we first form the gradient, uh, which is just you know, the stochastic estimate of the gradient on some mini batch, but we, we, uh, we use the inverse, if you want, of this, of this matrix S to, to compute the updates for our parameters. And this matrix S uh, is, uh, is what we call, uh, I mean, what is called the, the quantum geometric tensor, or quantum Fischer information. And this is a strongly related uh, uh, to the classical Fischer information that would appear instead in this context uh, when uh, instead of modeling wave functions, we are interested in modeling uh, uh, probability distribution. So there's a strong connection between these two, um, but in general, uh, the quantum Fischer information uh, is, a, is a complex valued object, whereas you know, the classical Fischer information is, is a real valued object. So this is the technique that we typically use, and this can be made uh, to scale linearly with the number of parameters that you have in your system, just using, for example, uh, a sparse solver to solve this, uh, this, uh, this linear system of equation. Now, um, I, I was focusing at the beginning, I was telling you at the beginning also about the, uh, the problem of having uh, computationally efficient uh, wave functions. And this is the point that uh, I want to stress uh, a little bit more now. Uh, and uh, one thing that is, uh, is very important, uh, I think, also for the development of the field is like finding as much as possible states that are computationally tractable, following this definition given in a very nice paper by Van der Nest in 2009. So essentially, um, as I was telling you uh, before, what we do in Varishno Monte Carlo is that we need to basically sample from this psi square distribution. Uh, however, it is, uh, you can show that for, to, in order to be really efficient, uh, and uh, really efficient means that you can compute expectation values of, uh, of, uh, of operators, for example, of the Hamiltonian in polynomial time, uh, you, you need to be able to, to sample from this probability, those, these probacks uh, as written in this paper, uh, using only uh, polynomially many resources. So this is a strong requirement for this approach. Uh, and you need also to, to be able to, to compute this uh, basically this amplitude. So if you want the, the output of this, of this network in the previous, uh, in the previous slides uh, using uh, only polynomial time resources. And um, in general, in the classical literature of variational uh, states, uh, there are, there's a lot of cases that are not computationally uh, efficient. So they're not computationally tractable uh, according to this definition. So for example, if you take uh, a, gener a generic neural deep, deep uh, quantum state, so a state parameterized by a deep network. These are not computationally tractable because you cannot sample from them exactly, essentially. There are other class of states like PEPs that are tensor networks in two dimensions that are not computationally tractable because you cannot sample from them and you cannot also compute the amplitudes exactly in polynomial time. 
but there are other states in 1D that are instead computationally tractable, like tensor networks based on uh, um, matrix quadrant states. So in general, there's a tension between uh, you know, having, uh, I would say that especially in two dimensions, uh, uh, there weren't many, uh, there aren't many computationally tractable states. Um, and uh, uh, indeed, the, the reason, uh, for example, why general neural networks are not uh, computationally tractable is because um, if you want to sum all this probability, we have to perform a Markov chain Monte Carlo, and this is known to be um, inefficient, so there's no guarantee that you can uh, convert to the, to, the, to the distributions you want to in, in polynomial time. Um, and you can have large correlation times also that, 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 that make the, the, the computation of gradients and expectation values uh, uh, potentially inefficient. So to go around this problem, what we did is that we introduced a generalization of uh, autoregressive models um, to uh, quantum states. So for those of you who are familiar with uh, autoregressive models for probability distributions, um, uh, you know that uh, essentially an autoregressive model uh, representing a probability distribution um, is nothing but a product of, of conditional probabilities. So actually, let's see it uh, here uh, for a moment. So essentially, imagine that instead of having psi now, I had a probability p of x, then uh, in auto, the autoregressive property means that you can decompose this p of x as a product of conditionals. So p of x1, p of x2 given x1, and so on and so forth. And uh, what we did is that we generalized this conditional fun structure also to wave functions where instead of representing, again, a positive object or probability, we represent a complex valued object, but that uh, apart from that, has the same conditional structure that we would expect from, the, from a standard probability distribution. With the important difference is that, um, uh, with the important difference that uh, the, the full normalization is, uh, is different. So for, for, for a probability distribution, you know that each of these conditionals is, 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 um, is normalized in L1 norm. Whereas for wave functions, what we do is that we impose that each of these conditionals is uh, normalized in L2 norm. So essentially that the sum of the squared of this psi is normalized to one. And this is, uh, if you want, a slightly different uh, technical, uh, a slightly different technical point, but it's very important, uh, essentially, because we want the full state psi squared to be normalized to one. And this is the only definition that really makes sense. So in practice, what we do is that we use, uh, uh, for example, masked convolutional networks to represent this, uh, to, to enforce this, uh, um, uh, this uh, conditional structure. And specifically in, in our work, we use the pixel CNN, which is a two dimensional uh, neural network, convolutional neural network, where some of the, of the inputs that uh, in, the, in these receptive fields are zero, zeroed out. And if you do that properly, uh, you can uh, guarantee that uh, essentially the, the output of the uh, of the network, uh, essentially this layer here that, that computes all the conditionals, uh, has the correct uh, uh, um, uh, autoregressive property that I was uh, uh, writing before. And uh, an important consequence is that you can do exact sampling, so without doing any Markov chain from these neural network states, because what you do is that you sample the first uh, spins so or the first variable just using the, the first conditional. And then once you've done this and you fix the S1, you use uh, this value to sample the second spin, the third spin, and so on and so forth until you reach the, the last uh, spin you are, you are interested in sampling. And again, there is no rejection and the sampling is completely exact. So we completely remove the, the Markov chain uh, bottleneck. So in the next talk, there will be more discussion about this so also by, by Juan, and this is uh, really a technique that is uh, very fruitful also in, in many aspects of quantum physics that you will see uh, also later. Now, uh, removing this sampling bottleneck is, apart from being a nice thing uh, from the conceptual point of view is nice because it also gives you better results. Um, so this is, for example, results on the transverse field dicing model, uh, which is you know, a simple uh, two dimensional model where you have uh, not only the classical leasing part, but also transverse field. And you see that uh, this is the error of error on the energy that if you uh, go in a region where you have uh, typically with Markov chain a godicity problems, because you have, for example, uh, these domains of ferromagnetic uh, states, uh, instead using this direct sampling, so uh, again, uh, completely going uh, beyond the Markov chain approach, using direct sampling, we can achieve also much better accuracy on the ground state energy for, for this model in minus five. This can be made actually even smaller if you, if you, if you play more with this, uh, with this method. 
So just to give you also an idea on, on other models, uh, on the progression of the accuracy that we, one can achieve using these deeper models, if you consider the error that you make on another prototypical model in 2D, the Eisenberg model, um, using a shallow network, like the one that we used in the first works, uh, and uh, you increase the size of this network, essentially you could get to around 10 to the minus 3 or higher 10 to the minus 4 accuracy for this model. Uh, if you start using commonets, so what we did in 2019, uh, uh, but they don't have this uh, autoregressive property, you get uh, already to a much uh, uh, better accuracy. Uh, but you know, using these uh, you know, convolutional states that also have this autoregressive property, you can uh, essentially solve this model uh, to all purposes in, in uh, basically in an exact way. Um, and you can improve substantially also other variational approaches that, uh, that were uh, dealing with this, um, with this uh, benchmark model. Now, there is a main open issue in this, uh, in this field, uh, which uh, I will uh, just briefly sketch here. And the main issue is that uh, when you are dealing with a model with, uh, which has a complex assigned structure, so for example, a frustrated spin, um, uh, it happens, and this has been discussed in this, in this paper, that uh, you can have a large uh, so-called sampling complexity. So the number of samples that you need to, to describe correct, correctly if you want the ground state it can be relatively large as a function of, of the system size. So here they, they show basically how many samples you need to, to get the, the, the ground state with some uh, fixed uh, the fidelity or accuracy in, in, your, in, your, uh, in your target uh, wave function. And essentially, they, they, they see that you can see that if you have something like 36 pins or so in this com complicated model that has almost a random structure in the, in the science, um, you, you need a number of samples which can be relatively large. So it can be in the large 10 to the 4. Um, even though, I mean, uh, the open problem uh, at this point, I would say, is that uh, it is not clear for, uh, for large systems uh, how this, uh, this thing will scale. Um, and uh, if uh, in, in the problems we are interested in, uh, we will be able to somehow uh, get, uh, get away with uh, still a manageable number of samples, uh, it might be even uh, 10 to the 8, um, but uh, not you know, 10 to the 20 or something that we cannot manage. So this is uh, still uh, an open issue, I would say, that is also uh, very, very interesting and there is a lot of work to be done also from the statistical physics community. I think. Now, let me uh, briefly go also um, to the other part of the story that I wanted to, uh, to talk about uh, today, which is instead the, um, the, the problem of using uh, a quantum computer instead of a classical computer to perform this uh, variational search for, for, uh, for my ground state. Um, essentially, uh, the, the main idea uh, it, is to use uh, what is known in the community as the variational quantum eigen solver. Um, which uh, is, uh, in a nutshell, for those of you who are familiar with quantum computing concepts, the idea of um, parameterizing uh, the, the output, if you want, of, of a given quantum circuit uh, with a unitary that depends on, on a set of uh, variational parameters theta. So this unitary can be something that you can apply, you can implement a set of gates, quantum gates, that you can apply on your, uh, efficiently on your quantum computer. Um, and uh, so basically, uh, what, what happens is that the, the, the variational state, psi of theta, if you want, that you are preparing, is given by some simple, easily preparable initial state times the action of this unitary u of theta, which can be, again, tuned and where you can change variationally these parameters, okay? And then what you can do is very similar in its spirit uh, to, to what we've done before, in the sense that we, we, we measure stochastically the expectation value of the Hamiltonian uh, of interest, for example, if we have a chemistry problem, um, we, will, uh, we will have a certain quantum chemistry Hamiltonian describing a, a molecule. And uh, this is done, uh, I mean, I'm saying stochastically because what you do is that you essentially write the Hamiltonian in terms of a product of, of Pauli operators, uh, typically a large number of these. And what you can do is that you can measure in the computational basis that is the, in which these operators are diagonal, <clears throat> then you take samples or, or in, in this basis, and then you compose these, uh, these observables to get an estimate of the average of the amortone. Now, the first issues that you have in this field is, uh, as you can imagine, uh, the same issue that we have in, uh, in the classical case. <clears throat> Sorry. Uh, so essentially, we have the problem of optimizing these parameters in, uh, in an efficient way, right? So, <clears throat> so in this paper, uh, what we did is that uh, we, uh, we connected some of the already existing uh, uh, strategies that were uh, available 
uh, in, the, in the quantum domain, so if you want this BQE domain, uh, with some of the other strategies that we've been using uh, for, for a long time in the classical domain, which are the ones that are uh, down in the, in, the, in, the, in the lower part of this diagram. So specifically, um, uh, we, th this is a quantum geometric tensor that I introduced before, so this matrix S that is defined in terms of gradients of the, of the wave function can be uh, really equivalently also estimated stochastically in a similar way on the quantum hardware. Um, and uh, um, essentially, uh, you can show that there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between the stochastic reconfiguration and uh, the, the quantum variational imaginary time evolution. So what you would do on a quantum hardware in order to simulate the imaginary time evolution in a variational way. And there is also a one-to-one -one correspondence between the variational real-time evolution that you can do on the, on the quantum hardware and the time-dependent variational Monte Carlo, which is a, a technique that we introduce in the classical setting to, to simulate the dynamics of, uh, of quantum states with a stochastic technique. And also, again, the, the natural gradient uh, as an analogous in uh, what people are using to optimize uh, uh, quantum for quantum machine learning applications uh, based uh, where you are interested in using high order optimizers that go beyond if you want uh, uh, first order uh, approaches. So all of these are somehow, um, I would argue that uh, using this uh, quantum geometric tensor is really helpful in uh, using, in getting um, uh, accurate results on the, also on these uh, BQE uh, 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 circuits. And uh, basically what we did also is that uh, we, we introduced an approximation, a simplification over the original algorithm to estimate this, uh, this, uh, this matrix. So this uh, quantum natural gradient, uh, which is uh, a block diagonal approximation where we consider only uh, correlations among uh, some layers of commuting gates. So without going too much into the details, but this allows us to use less quantum resources, which are very scarce if you want on, on existing uh, contemporary quantum hardware. And uh, essentially what we see is that we achieve uh, some I mean, faster convergence than the standard uh, vanilla uh, gradient descent or even Adam, which is the green lines here, even using this block diagonal approximation. So you can approach in a faster way uh, the ground state. But most importantly, you use also less quantum evalu evalu evaluation. So really the number of calls that you have to do to the quantum hardware and you want to do, you want to do as few as possible of those is also uh, smaller when you use this, uh, this uh, quantum natural gradient uh, with respect to the state-of-the-art uh, COBIL approach that is used, for example, by IBM and others. Um, now, the, the second uh, problem that I will uh, briefly discuss, the uh, second issue with uh, the BQE, is related to the problem of, uh, of reducing the number of measurements. So I've told you at the beginning that in, in this hardware, we want to estimate the expectation value of the Hamiltonian using samples from the quantum computer. However, it turns out that uh, even for very simple molecules, so let's say H2, and I will give you the, how many measurements you need in that case in, in a moment, but even for a very simple molecule like H2, you, you might require uh, several millions of more measurement on uh, even very small uh, systems to, to have uh, an accuracy on the energy which is of the order of uh, um, uh, what you would need to, 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 to have chemical accuracy on, on, on the physical properties. So this is a severe problem, I would say, for, for these approaches. And what we've been trying to do is to try to reduce this, uh, the number of uh, energy measurements that you need uh, using a machine learning approach. This is uh, work we did in collaboration with uh, IBM. Uh, and essentially the idea is that you want to uh, model the distribution of the outcomes for your variational uh, simulation on the quantum hardware with some neural network in a way that uh, you can trade uh, somehow uh, uh, with, with a bias. So you, you are now putting a bias because you are parameterizing this, your distribution with uh, some fixed parametrical form with as much smaller variance when determining these, uh, these uh, quantum properties. So really this is a, an interplay between variance and bias. And uh, the way we use, uh, uh, we, the, the way we, we somehow train our networks, in this case using data from the experiment, is with this approach uh, um, that, is, uh, that we call neural network tomography. I don't have time to go into the details of this approach, but essentially we take measurements from uh, different bases uh, in, in the quantum uh, hardware, and uh, we minimize the KL divergence over the different bases that uh, are accessed uh, in, the, in the experiment. So this is a typically unsupervised uh, learning approach. This is not too different from what you do in standard unsupervised uh, learning. And uh, just to give you an example of uh, what we can do in quantum chemistry, 
this is the number of measurements that you need to get uh, uh, to, to have uh, an accuracy, the probability of having an accuracy, which is of one kilocal per mole, which is the, somehow the, the target if you want to have uh, some chemical accuracy. And you see, again, for, for H2, if you use the standard approach, uh, you will need something around 10 to the 8 or so um, number of measurements to get this, uh, this accuracy. And this is really expensive if you want to do it uh, on, on the hardware. Uh, however, if you use this um, biased but uh, you know, lower variance approach, we can uh, get the same accuracy uh, essentially with uh, three or four orders of magnitude uh, less uh, num number of measurements. Uh, and the bias that we put uh, is, uh, is less than, uh, than this one kilocal per mole. So this is the important uh, um, message, if you want. And the same applies also for other molecules. And um, we really believe that uh, possibly improving this technique, but we can uh, help uh, these, uh, these, um, these VQE approaches to, to, to use less resources uh, on, on the hardware. Um, so very quickly, yeah, we have uh, this software, which is called NetCat, where these things are, are implemented. Some of these things are implemented. Uh, I invite you to, to have a look at this. Um, and uh, just as, 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 a, as a short announcement in the, in the version 3.0 that will, uh, will come out soon, we will have also support for JAX and other um, uh, framework like PyTorch to represent these complex value uh, wave functions, which are not always easy to represent in uh, with standard uh, frameworks. And uh, again, we, we've uh, somehow bridged uh, the, the, this, uh, this gap uh, and uh, this is uh, the way to, I mean, one of the ways to do that. And uh, if you are interested, you can certainly have a look at uh, our own page. Right, so let me give you uh, a, uh, an outlook since I'm uh, running out of time, but uh, essentially um, there is uh, uh, a lot of interesting uh, open problems and challenges, even though with this, uh, there's been a lot of progress and uh, I would argue also a lot of progress in this field, a lot of uh, interesting uh, results beyond the state of the art. But there's still some open issues. For example, um, one, uh, I think, main issue is how to efficiently parameterize sign and phases uh, of these complex objects, which is, uh, if you want, an issue that has not been uh, uh, historically treated in, in the standard machine learning literature. So this, there is a lot of room here for, for improvement. And uh, uh, we are still also in a hero heroic phase, I would say, for, uh, for, for studying fermions. So, so far, I've shown you only or mostly um, spin problems. Um, but uh, there's been this year or last year a lot of uh, new development in studying fermions, electrons. Uh, you will see from, uh, from Frank Noé uh, tomorrow, I believe, uh, some uh, new results in this direction where they use uh, neural networks to study fermions. But really, we are still in the early, early stages of these developments. There's a lot of room for, for, new, uh, for new approaches here. And uh, since it has been asked also before, I think that still, I mean, as in all physical problems, the main issue that we also have here is how to enforce efficiently some of the symmetries we care about. So for example, exchange symmetries. So again, fermionic uh, or bosonic symmetry in these problems is, uh, I would say, still largely an open problem in the sense that uh, there are several approaches, but uh, there is not like a, an agreed upon way of doing this in an efficient way. In a, in, a, uh, in a deep neural network, or even SU2, global SU2 symmetry is, uh, is uh, I would say, still uh, a largely open, uh, open issue. Okay, so thank you uh, for your time. Thank you very, very much for this uh, very interesting talk. So um, <clears throat> I think we, can, we have, uh, let's say, a few minutes for questions. In, if uh, some of you would like to to say something and can I ask a question? Sure, sure. Yeah. So um, as far as I understand it, both the quantum parameterization approach and the classical parameterization approach, you're trying to approximate your states with a let's say polynomial number of parameters, right? Mm -hmm. So that you can handle it because in both cases otherwise you couldn't optimize it or write it down. And do I get it right that the variational quantum approach basically is just the way where you manage to write down, in some sense, different states that you would do classically? Or like, what is your, like, why is VQE better than the classical approach if in both cases you only have a polynomial? Yeah, yeah, no, yeah, I understand the, yeah, I understand the question. Yeah, uh, this is a, you know, a million dollar question, actually. I think that there is no... Uh, well, as far as I know, there is no uh, strong argument uh, or 
proof, if you want, that uh, the, the quantum states are uh, uh, can be more powerful in interesting applications than uh, than uh, the, the classical ones. Huh? So, if you want to find the ground state of the electron gas, for example, or the upper model, I mean, I think that uh, this is going to be equally hard both on the quantum machine and on the classical uh, ansatz. Uh, but uh, I mean. Uh, I mean, say that the, the interesting thing is that on the quantum hardware, you can have access to off-diagonal uh, operators uh, more efficiently than you would could, that you can do on the classical uh, hardware on the classical uh, simulation. So, in this sense, uh, it might uh, open the way, especially once we will have much larger hardware, uh, to studying uh, some ansatz that are not uh, efficiently describable in terms of classical uh, wave functions. But you know, I'm a great fan of classical states. I'm not saying that we should uh, get rid of them, actually. <laughs> okay, but that would mean like, in theory, if you would manage to write down the same functions in this subspace of the Hilbert space, then you could also do that classically, right? right. If you would manage to get a good representation of that. Uh, yes, but, uh, um, right, yeah. So there is, uh, still there's a, fem there are some states that you cannot write efficiently when parameterized with uh, classically, I mean, at least probably there's no way to write them. Okay. The state that you write on the quantum case. Oh, so thanks. yeah, I was expecting a question from Max Welling on this. <laughs> so the uh, so the question so, is uh, maybe uh, he wants to. You can have, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I just, so so I actually included a reference for a paper that we recently submitted to archive, which may be of interest, which actually ha which is both permutation, yeah, equivariant, which could deal with the uh, sort of bosonic fermionic degrees of you know uh, permutation equivariance as well as uh, se3 equivariance which could deal with your s you know we'd have to generalize to su2 i guess so maybe i don't know maybe this could be relevant i don't yeah, know yeah no, no that's a great point yeah, um yes so uh, the, the su2 symmetry i was referring to is really the, the tensor product of local uh, su2 symmetry so it's a bit uh, Harder than uh, than a single rotation that you have in the in the in the in the, in the other settings. I guess you you've been studying. Um, so uh, there's been some solution in this case where people use the uh, Klebsch Gordon uh, essential representations of the wave functions. But uh, still, uh, um, yeah, I mean, actually, yeah, I would be very interested to to see if there could be some extension of your work in this direction. So is, yeah. is that more like a gauge uh, symmetry because you have sort of independent uh, transformations on the different uh, you know, uh, components. Oh, essentially, you have n spins, and uh, you are yeah. looking for an eigenstate of the total uh, angular momentum of s square. Uh, I see. And, and uh, so, so, and each spin has a, is a, is, a, is a, in a sense a rotor, right? So, and you have the tensor product of n spins. I see. So, so the total symmetry oh, yeah. is really the tensor product of this, and it's uh, that's why it's more complicated uh, okay. than having a, a single uh, rotation. Yeah. Yeah, the other but, thing but I want to ask yeah. is about the area law. So do, do, do your your ansatz, does that satisfy the area law? Because I think many ground states wave functions satisfy uh, the area law for entanglement, right? Yeah, yeah. So um, they can satisfy both. So if, you're, uh, if you take uh, a network which is, uh, uh, whose depth does not increase uh, polynomially with, uh, with, uh, with the system sites, but is, uh, for example, fixed depth, and you take a uh, component like filters or short train filters, then you satisfy area law, yes. But you can also right. satisfy volume law if you want, and this is useful for, for example, long time dynamics, uh, if you increase the size of the network, the depth of the network. Yeah. Thank you. So you can do both. Yeah. Okay. So thank you very much. Uh,